The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. This podcast is brought to you by Challenger, who believe in providing customers with financial security for a better retirement. Challenger's lifetime annuities provide different payment solutions to suit your client's financial circumstances and needs. For income certainty, they can choose CPI indexed or fixed payments. Alternatively, they can choose to have payments linked to changes in the RBA cash rate or investment markets. Challenger can provide your clients with a monthly income for life so they can enjoy today knowing they'll always have income in the future. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with John Caccia. He is an advisor, founder um, and head visionary at the Australian Financial Advisors Group or AFA Group Wealth. Uh, he's also the National Practitioner's Chair at the Association of Financial Advisors. So John's super passionate about uh, great advice and, and financial literacy, both in his business for his clients and for the industry. So I'm keen to pick his brains a bit on that. Uh, John, thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Um, it's, been, um, it's been really great actually seeing your journey as well too, mate. So today we'll be talking about my journey, but maybe off this we'll have to speak about your journey as well because um, <laughs> I've been very impressed by it. But thanks for having me today. Oh, mate, you can turn the turn the microphone around if if you want to, but um, <laughs> we're we're obviously aligned because we're twinning on our team numbers, uh, sitting in a nice neat twenty one at the moment. Mm. So, um, you know, brothers for life on that one. But, uh, mate, uh, I thought you've been in business for for a long time, um, 13, 13 years and a bit. So, uh, I'm keen to hear. Like, tell us a bit about that story. Yeah. So. In a way, it feels like it was just yesterday, but then in another way, it feels like it was forever ago. So um, it depends on how my brain's thinking. But yeah, it's I've been in the profession actually since I was 14. My mum um, did the good old, you know, 14, nine months, John, go get a job. And uh, my cousin at the time, he still does, has a financial advisory business and go to do work experience at my cousin's financial advisory practice, uh, traditional kind of risk writing predominantly back in the day. Uh, but got in there and I said, "Ooh, this is this. I can make a career out of this. This is a really, really awesome." Now, don't get me wrong. As a fourteen-year-old or as a teenage boy, it was the flashy cars and the nice things, and you know what the industry had at that time. But as I started to learn more about what was going on, I could see the impact that it was having. You know, I started to experience my first claim payments and. You know, the, the changes that made for that family who was, say, left or if that person was, you know, had a traumatic event. And so I really started to get a passion for it. So, you know, after school, school holidays, you know, whatever opportunity I could do, I was working in that practice. And me and my cousin, for the people that know both of us together, and his name's Christopher Casher, if you, you want to know, but um, based out in, in Melbourne, but we're very alike. So people that both know us together, they're like, oh, yeah, I can see that they're cousins. Maybe not about the way we look, but the way we talk and the way we go about things. And when, you know, when you're when so alike to someone, especially when it comes to family, um, let's be truthful, you can sometimes butt heads, okay? And <laughs> it was better for my personal relationship and our personal relationships for me to part ways. And that actually happened at the age of 20. So I find myself as a 20-year-old, Done my diploma at that point. I was studying financial planning in uni, which was kind of unknown of that beat. I think there was only maybe one other course beside the one I was doing available at uni at that point in time. And um, I remember back then I had a moment where 
I wanted to walk away from the financial advice industry. I actually remember I wanted as much as I loved it. I was just like, I need a break. And mm. I took a few months off just to kind of gather myself before I started the business. But I remember when a guy um, called me from MLC back in the day, who was the licensee I was a part of, okay, and said, John, we can't lose you, mate. Like, you know, you've done that much studying, you've done whatever. Like, you need to come back. I'm like, all right, well, maybe I'll go work for someone. And he's like, yeah, you could, but how are you going to go with that, knowing my personality? And he goes, now, have you thought about running your own practice? So I'm a 20-year-old guy. Go back, speak to my old man who was in business. He was a kind of entrepreneurial mind back in the day. And uh, he said to me, John, you're 20 years old. You've got no your family. You've got no responsibilities. Give it a crack. And so I took the plunge and uh, started a financial advisory business at, you know, 20 years ago. So if everyone's doing the maths, yes, I'm turning 34 this year. Um, but just so you can just figure that out. And, mate, what a hell of a ride it's been since then. You know, um, we've had FOFA, we've had um, raw commissions, we've had everything that's gone through. Personally, I've had some spinal surgery along the way. I've had some gastric sleeve surgery, you know, still running the business all the way through that. But, you know, reality, it's one that I'll, I love um, because where the, what we're doing today is impactfully changing people's lives and absolutely transforming them. And, you know, the comments that clients are giving me is exactly what I, I thought about as that 20-year-old guy that I could, I could make happen and it's happening today. And it really warms my heart to see where the profession is today. And I, and I mean that. And probably, Ben, you think the same way. Like the, 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 the impacts we're having are just glimmers of what I thought were going to happen, but now they're actually in the forefront and I'm really excited about what's, what's to come. Yeah, I think it's a great time to be an advisor. We were just chatting a bit offline and I think the tide is turning a little bit as, as uh, advice is getting better and better by the week and month. I think like, you know, so many great advisors out there. There's always been great advisors out there, but I think there's more and more, you know, getting rid of some of the, uh, you know, unethical advisors, the ones that have led to a, a few of the issues that we've seen in the past. Also just raising the standards around, you know, what needs to happen and, and like, yeah, there's been a lot of legislative change. Um, not all of it has, has, you know, I think hit the mark to 100%, but obviously that's a very difficult proposition. And um, I think all of it has been well intentioned. And the overall impact has been that things have gotten better. Um, that plus, I think, advisors getting better, just more passionate, you know, tech making things easier, clients getting more savvy, investments getting more developed. Um, I think people learning. So, um, I think it's going to, we're sort of coming into this golden age of advisors where people know that advice is good. They know that they need to pay for it. They uh, recognize that it's there. They get good experiences when they come in. And then that means that they talk to their mates more, get more out there. So I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think it's really, really exciting. And um, yeah, good to, good to see less of those, those horror stories that, that we've all heard um, and more of the good news stories as well. Uh, yeah. They, very good to see. You mentioned though that when we we're just chatting a little bit before we fired up the uh, the recording here that your your business obviously been around for over a decade, but it's really been your team has sort of increased by four times um, the size just in the last couple of years. What's what's that? Uh, what's driven that? And what's that journey been like? <sighs> Um, actually, as you can probably see from my, my, my sound just then, um, it's been very interesting, let's be honest. Um, walking into COVID, we thought that, um, you know, we didn't expect how well prepared we were, to be honest with you, mate. And a lot of our growth happened when COVID started. And now looking back and having that reflection point, I think we were well primed. Like we had Royal Commission happen, really batten down the hatches, get the processes right, get the technology right, get everything really like bang on. And then COVID happened and we walked into COVID just like from a tech piece perspective, we were already about 80% Zoom by that point. We were digital from the start as in regards to docs and stuff like that, the kind of the whole way through. But we really were like, we were very well prepared, probably more well prepared than I thought we were going to be. So then we walk into COVID and we then really, I thought to myself, well, in a time like this, we need to be on the front foot in regards to communication. Communication is key. And one of the things that we did along the way on our journey was when there was heightened, I don't know, let's say the North Korean issue where Kim Jong-un was you know, trying to shoot missiles, we were really pumping out the communication to our clients. And I think when a time like that happens, we pumped out communication 
bigger and better than ever than we've ever done before. Okay. And so what ended up happening, I think, was in hindsight was we were really on the front front of clients' minds when they needed that assurity and then when they needed that, you know, that 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 person to keep them on, on track. And so on the flow of that, that was I think the proof in the pudding. And I remember saying to my team right now, this is the time when we earn our money. Okay. This is the time when we earn our money. And the proof was in the pudding. The client referrals went out of out of control. Um, people saw that it wasn't just talking the talk, but walking the walk. And I think in 2020 back then, that's the reality. Like, you know, it was, these people can say whatever the hell they want to say, but are they actually talking the talk and walking the walk? And this is when it was. And so we've kept on that. But as well too, along the way, obviously the business has changed. Remember, I started in kind of the risk space. So you got to think about it, it was like risks, basic super, and it's kind of developed. And it's developed to the point where it is right now where it's very educational based, okay? So I think a lot of the growth has come because we're not just money managers. We're more than that, okay? We're educators, we're behavioral coaches, we're mindset coaches. And Mm. when you're integrating all of those combined, we're delivering for our clientele, which isn't the clientele for everyone, exactly what's needed to make transformative experiences for many, many, many years to come. And as time goes by, it's having that compounding effect. Now, on the back of that, you're then obviously seeing the growth in the team to keep up with that growth. And obviously, a lot of our growth that we're talking offline for me, Ben, um, and I think for yourself, is, is organic. So it is from client referrals. It is from you know us doing a great job and telling other people. So with gro- growth, I say everyone has got growing pains, okay? So sometimes I do refer to everything going on as like running a childcare center. Um, because there's always moving paths and snotty noses and everything that we've got to take in control. But <laughs> for people that know me know that I like living life in the fast lane. So, uh, yeah, enjoying every moment of it. Nice. I love that analogy. Um, what what have you mentioned a couple of things there already, but what have been the biggest shifts in your business, you know, over the time that you've been going? Yeah, I think the biggest one has been the focus on how can we make a, like, long-term impactful change for our clients and becoming obsessed with that. I think in 2022, we're more client-centric than we've probably ever been, okay? Uh, it's, an, it's it's become rightly so an obsession. My wife, you know, reminds me how obsessed I am in what I do, but it's becoming an obsession about being so client-centric and how do we make impactful changes for life? And so what I mean by that is if you're comparing super funds, yes, it's going to maybe moving from one super fund to the other super fund is going to help them. But it's not going to, what I believe, change their life. The changing of the life comes from the behavioral coaching, comes from the education, comes from how do we make sure that they're getting smarter with their money decisions every single day. And I think that's what the game changer is for us in 2022, that major focus on the educational piece that sits around the money management. Mm. And so talk us through that. How how do you go about that with clients? Because that sounds great. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing is just the constant engagement on different paces. So for example, if if the cash rate's going up by half a percent, explaining to them what that actually means, having a communication system where it actually understands what they mean. Because sometimes as practitioners we in, in, the, in the industry, we sometimes forget what other people don't know. Yeah. Yes, we might know what the impacts are because we've got an economic background, but your client doesn't necessarily know. So walking them through that education, it might be as simple as Ben, a email that's broken down, not a sales email where you're trying to refinance a home loan if you're a mortgage broker as well, or you know trying to do this. It's not. It's this is what it means. Yeah, breaking it down into the language that they understand, and then also backing that up with a. Hey, and also, if you want to know more, maybe here's an article that I've done, or here's an article that I've seen. Take an option to read and ask me if you've got any questions. Similar to what I would see if I was at school. Yeah, back in the day, yeah, the teacher walking through. These are the basic concepts. But if you want to learn a little bit more, here's some extra reading for you. And we really focus on making them smart, like smarter with money to the point where we'll have in meetings. Did I explain myself correctly? Yes, you did. Can you just repeat it to me so that I understand that you understand? Yeah. And then working through the education. Yes, it's a harder burn. It's a longer burn. But if we're going to make impactful changes, we want to create these people into absolute ninjas when it comes to money. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's create them into ninjas because we know financial literacy is also linked to other things like risk tolerance. Yeah. If they're smarter with their money, they can tolerate a little bit more. You know, they're not crapping themselves. Yeah. When they shouldn't be. 
Yeah, let's walk them mm. through this so that they become absolutely, like I say, wealth creation ninjas, um, you know, as time goes by. Mate, I love that. What would you say, though, to the people that are fearful that if they teach their clients too much, that then the clients won't need them to be their advisor anymore? Cool. So let's use this analogy. So I, Ben, you're a tennis player, and I've just teached you how to win Wimbledon. We then back that up by winning the US Open. We then back that up by winning the Australian Open, okay? And we're about to go to the French Open. Do you sack the person who just lost you? You just won three uh, three Grand Slams with? No, you're going for the you're going for the fourth. So as long as we continue to level you up and achieve your goals and aspirations, that's not going to be the case. And I am yet to see Ben out of my clients people who are more obsessed with wealth creation than me. Okay, so <laughs> I guess they I guess they keep me on my game to keep learning and learning more. And as we know in the world of money. You may think you know it all and you have just scratched the surface. Yeah, we are always learning and we're always, you know, keeping our eyes on other things. So people might be, for example, really knowledgeable in, say, cash flow management. Yeah, but they're then weak on their investment planning. Yeah, they're very good on their investment planning, but they might be atrocious on their wealth protection. Or might be as simple as how many people can control their emotions. You ask them, they say, yeah, 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 I can. Yeah. But when it comes to their own money, I can assure you, even financial advisors should have financial advisors. In my business, I've actually got another financial advisor who takes care of mine and my wife's affairs, yeah? because Not because they, they're teaching me anything from a money management perspective, is to make sure what we say we're going to do, we do, and we emotionally are not emotionally connected to our um, investment decisions. I love that. And I'm, I'm completely aligned. I know for us with our clients at Pivot, like people they learn more and over time they get better at certain things. But what that allows us to do is to elevate those conversations. So we're talking about more like we try to avoid the jargon, but we get more technical with things. We get more nuanced and then people are learning better. They're more confident, um, get that. But I think it is still a bit of a barrier for some people that are fearful. I think it's something that's, uh, that's unfounded though. On the flip side of my pr- previous question, sorry, I was just going to say, like, there's you mentioned a bunch of things that have changed there, but what 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 are the things that haven't changed? Oh, listen, I think client first has always been the case. I think you know when there was the introduction of things like best interest duty. I think as much as people thought that they were like massive changes, I think for us there was kind of a no change. Yes, there was some tick boxes that needed to be done, but we were client first from the start. Mm. I think the I think the other thing as well too is, and I hate I hate using the word, but I'm going to say, say this because it needs to be said. There's been this whole beating up of like selling your services. Now, I think the whole time, like going back to my really risk days, you know, we're talking about this young, young guy. We were learned about sales skills and NLP and how to, how to sell actually don't think they have changed nearly a bit. Yes, it's like what you're selling, like still has always been in the best interest. But I think what has stayed consistent is making sure that you're, for example, selling protection, for example. No one wakes mm. up still today and says, oh, today's the day that I need life insurance. Yeah, <laughs> or today's the day we need to sell this. And what? why am I saying this? And why am I also bringing this up in this conversation? We have staff that are obviously coming through uni. Yeah, and I think this is a big part that's not what's being told. They're coming there and the client's going, oh, no, nah, premiums are too high. Yeah, of course, it's a cost. Yeah, you've got to work through that and have that sales ability to come over those objections because you don't want three years down the track, yeah, them going, oh, yeah, we should have taken out that life insurance policy because this is what's happened. So actually, it's, I wanted to bring this up because I think it's it's been beaten up because of obviously what's going on, but what has stayed consistent is my firmness when it comes to my conversations like Mm. i will sell insurance if i believe the family needs insurance um but i think also being client first has has remained the same throughout and i think the other thing as well too is i've I've always had this focus on going beyond my clients and what i mean by that is since i first started i've always let's say it's a young family it was always to do it. How could we set it up for them and how we could set it up for the kids? Yeah. And obviously now being a decade on, um, it's not to say that we've gone to grandchildren, but we're also obviously giving advice for grandchildren now or upcoming grandchildren as well too. So it's always been a business that has been designed to focus on intergenerational wealth. Okay. Um, and we're doing a lot of that today.
Mm, I love that. And I think that sales is so important because we're selling, we've got to sell people on ideas because money success is something that, you know, you, we're naturally fearful. Like you mentioned, some of the emotion and psychology that sits around what we do, uh, that people need to be sold on the ideas that make sense for them. What people want to cling to is the super safe option that, um, you know, makes them feel good, but that stops them from playing a bigger game when it comes to their money. So we've got to sell them on that idea and help them, you know, identify and, and recognize what the opportunity is for them so that they can take advantage of those opportunities, whether that's making sure that they've got the right protection in place so that they can have that peace of mind, whether it's, you know, diversifying out of their super concentrated holdings with their employee share plan or, you um, mm-hmm whether it's, you know, saving a bit more money so that they can reach their goals a bit sooner or selling them on our services and, yeah. um, you know, engaging with us in the first place. I think you have to be good at doing that because otherwise if you're not, you're doing the clients a disservice really because they've got this need that they don't recognise the importance of and um, they're not going to make any progress. Oh, my, we've, it's You're absolutely spot on. And, and this is what I think. I think over the last kind of five years, there's been this whole focus on technical, 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 that the sales mm. has started to kind of come away. But when I'm speaking to some of the most successful people in the profession, yeah, sales is like right up there. And we're not talking about the, you know, the wolf of Wall Street here. We're not talking about mm. that. It's like you said, it's the sales of the service. It's the sale. It's the sale of, hey, we can we can get you there. Like we can actually do this. Like this is the way we're going to do it through the technical, through the back. And and, and I had to kind of sell the dream. It, got to, it has a bad notion to it, but we're selling the inspiration. And so it's very important across the board around the whole financial service um, that we provide. It's very important that that's a staple, like you said as well too. Mm, absolutely. Tell us, John, how do you go about building your knowledge in, you know, the, the things that make sense for clients, what to focus on in your business? and educating yourself. Yeah, so there's a lot of like internal learning. And what I mean by that is obviously keeping up with the technical and stuff like that. That goes kind of without saying, but it's also looking outside, okay? So there'll be times where, you know, I'm having deep conversations with neuroscientists or psychologists or the medical profession and really trying to understand the behaviors of clients, okay? Um, My obsession of learning is all focused in the business. I think outside, if mate, if you got me to kind of, I don't know, go fishing, I'm a horrible fisherman because I don't don't even know how to put a hook on properly. Um, But when it comes to the profession, it's all about one, trying to make myself as technical as possible and keep up the day, but also it's around looking outside and saying, okay, well, what can I learn from external sources to make the business better? And for example, when you think about, I don't know, client services so trying to make them as happy as they can be um we can look outside to other professions or other industries to see how they make it so good like when we were in person i'll give you one ben for example um you know when you go into maccas and you order a coffee off the off the board okay what used to happen when we were in person is you'd come into our office the receptionist would give you an ipad We designed it exactly like McCafe and they could order the latte, soy latte, do whatever the hell they wanted. And then the coffee would come in the meeting room, waited for you like an ordering service. Okay. Now, as you can see, that did not come from, um, (laughs) that didn't come from um, financial planning. That came from me walking into Macca's and actually kind of grabbing that design and bringing it into the business. So I'm constantly learning on things outside of the business, but yeah, that's, that's how, that's how I do it. And tell me about you because you've gotten involved with the AFA. What what drove that, and uh, what are you focused on there? Yeah, so I was um, so when was it last year on the inaugural Great Advice Awards? I was the Victorian finalist, okay, aka the bridesmaid. Um, but Meniza in the AFA reached out to me and said, "Listen, John, you know you've kind of come out of nowhere. Where have you been? Okay, have you ever thought about you know getting into advocacy and joining the AFA?" And I said. I haven't really, and I thought that the associations didn't do much, to be honest with you. Um, I thought that <laughs> I thought that you know they were, and I was against them, to be honest with you. And I thought to myself, you know what, it's time to make a change of that. You look at all of the other professions that we kind of aspire to be similar to. You look at the legal profession, you look at the medical profession, and their associations are quite strong. Okay, I don't and know I'm like, to be a lawyer, just for the record. <laughs> yeah, I'm not aspiring to be a lawyer either. <laughs> but, you know, they've, they've got pretty strong associations, okay? And I thought to myself, well, 
if I was going to be like, what, what would I like ideally? Well, I would like an association to be batting for advisors and be having an impactful impact on, on the members. And so I said, you know what, stuff it. You know, in my 75 hour day, why not make it 80 hours? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, 75 hours a week. Why not make it 80 hours a week? Um, so, yeah, I joined the AFA, but my main big thing that I wanted to bring to the AFA, because they do do a lot of things, but the two main ones for me was what can I do to help improve the public perception of advice? Be the, be the eyes, eyes and ears for advisors to the boards and governments that govern our profession. And can I do that? Why not? Let's give it a crack. Yeah. And so that's starting to happen. Okay. I'm starting to listen. I'm starting to hear. I'm starting to be the voice, go back to the boards that then bring this back onto the government. Because like you said, you know, most people now, you know, the tide's starting to turn, but we're now, you know, for me, that dream is that, you know, if you're a millennial, for example, we use the millennials is, is like, no, they go to a dinner and they're like, you don't have an advisor? Advisor's cool, yeah? It's like you've got this, this person, yeah? I'd love for that to be like that. That's where, that's where I want it to be, okay? Where it's like, it's like FOMO, not having a financial advisor, okay? So we're getting there and I'm, I'm moving the needle on some stuff as well too to improve the public uh, image. And, you know, social media as well too is helping. I'm, I'm starting to, you know, work with a few financial advisors and Ben, you might be one as well too, where, you know, we can start to promote the great work that we do for the larger community so that they understand the value of advice, which I think is a bit of a misconception, okay? And then the more advisors that can help in that, the better, because really, if you look at our, our cousins, the mortgage brokers, when they were under pressure, um, they got a lot of support from the public. And I think we need mm -hmm. to do that to continue to move forward. The second thing is around financial literacy, okay? So, if you think about public perception as a big one, you know, financial literacy is a huge one. Being in, in the profession for nearly 20 years now, mate, um, I haven't seen our financial literacy across the board get better and it kind of scares me. I think being a father now of two children, okay, um, for me, I look at my sons and what do I want to do for them? Obviously, I want to you know, help them to become adults and stand on their own two feet. But a big portion of that is, is for them to be financially literate and understand, um, you know, later on how they can do this by themselves um, and not rely on the bank of mum and dad at that point in time, hopefully. <laughs> um, but, but the other thing is as well too, so we've got the, that, but the biggest thing is, is because I see right in front of us the wealth gap, okay? We're about to go through a transition where the baby boomers, are, you know, going to they're already accumulating some transitioned wealth, okay? And now that's going to go to the next generation. And I can just see the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And I start to look at it and I say to me, as a 34-year-old, and I look at other 34-year-olds, and I mean this in the most humblest way, like what makes me in an okay position in comparison to some other people? And people might be going, oh, John, your parents gave you money. No, they didn't, yeah? My parents are come from Malta, which was bombed by the Nazis for, you know, four years straight, and they came with nothing, yeah? Um, but it's that financial literacy that is, is, is dialing that up, okay? Helping me personally even to make better decisions, my clients to make better decisions with that money. But can we replicate that across the board? Can we do it by the masses? And as we know, the banks probably for some good reasons have got out of the financial literacy space, okay? But that means that there's a void. A void for Australians where financial literacy is required and can we do that? And Ben, as I was speaking about before in regards to our clients, we're making them smarter with money. Well, can I through the association and the, and the great work that advisors do, can we equip financial advisors to do this for the masses? Yeah, get mm -hmm. into the schools, get into the communities, maybe get some government funding along the way, yeah, and help to promote the fundamentals of financial literacy across the board. Mate, I love it. It's so good to see. I had to lean on um, just recently and she was unpacking that as well. And I think that, you know, like we're talking about advisors stretched, I think people are passionate and behind this. So I think laying it up for them on a silver platter makes things uh, a lot easier. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm pumped to see see the results. Tell us a little bit about the AFA group with it would be you just kicked off with XY. Yeah. So what we're trying to do, so actually one of my first kind of like my stamps on this was, hey, listen, the, the advice industry is a bit fragmented. There's like LinkedIn groups over here. There's multiple associations. There's a platform over here. And I said, the one that makes the most sense for me is if we get the associations on XY 
we've got all the community, all the great sharing that we've got. And could we have a group that's promoting the actual advocacy? Because John, the person that was reluctant to join the AFA, was like, what do you guys actually do? Yeah, where, where's all the advocacy? And then I'm walking in and they're doing thousands and thousands of interactions to make sure that some of the stuff gets through. Maybe what we need to do is communicate it a little bit better. Maybe the community needs to be that sense of we can be on X, Y, we can work together, jump in the community, in the community get updates about what's going on from an advocacy advocacy space. Hey, listen, John and his team are working, you know, on this for, with the public. Oh, they're working with this community to improve financial literacy or they're improving on, um, you know, the public image for financial advice. So for me, that is going to be a space that people can feel that they get a real understanding about what we're doing, okay, from an AFA perspective, so they're kept up to date. But they're also understanding that, you know, there's great people in these associations that are trying to do great things, okay? Um, so really, I saw it as a natural thing where we've got thousands and thousands of people on the XY platform. Can we use that platform to have kind of these rooms that they open the door and one of those doors is going to be the AFA and what the AFA is doing for financial advice. And obviously from mine, hopefully everyone hears my passion, you know, I'd love for as many people as possible to be in there to help my cause. So the more people I have that's supporting my cause um, and the cause of people like Delene and Ronnie P and the people that are jumping on board, the more ground sale we can get, get in front of those politicians to get those funding so that we can really start to improve the public image and financial literacy for all the for advisors and for all Australians when it comes to financial literacy. That's great. I think it's, um, as someone that's seen inside the AFA, I volunteered with them for a long time, was involved um, running the Gen X community for, for a while as well, that uh, I got to see what all of the stuff that was happening behind the scenes and it is immense, as you say. So I think that making it easy for people to access and see that stuff is good. Hopefully as well through that, that potentially can get some more feedback and input from advisors because I think if we can all get behind that more, we're getting a more you know diverse perspective on the different things and considerations. And I think that ultimately leads to a... Um, a better outcome for those policy submissions and the work that that's getting done. So that's great, mate. Uh, look, really appreciate you sharing your advisor story and I uh, love the passion coming through uh, in the financial literacy and advocacy space. For people that are keen to learn more or to, to get a better sense of, of what you guys are up to, what's the best way for them to, to do that? Yeah, I think for me personally, probably Instagram is probably my most public one. So if you just go to at the John Kasher, um, ta like handle, you'll, you'll find us. Um, obviously on LinkedIn as well too. If you just search my name, you, you should be able to find me on there. But I think the other one as well too is, um, biggest one for me is going to be actually on the platform itself. So in XY and on AFA as well too. So getting in there and seeing what John's doing and what the association's doing as well. And obviously from a business sense, if you just, you know, type in AFA Group Wealth, I'm sure it will come up on Google. If my marketing team's done anything well, they should, they should be able to do that. Um, but yeah, I think... I, know, I was doing some stalking before you jumped on, so definitely. <laughs> They're going all right? All right, cool. I'll just, I'll check the performance card later on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, just reach out. I think the biggest thing is as well too, is that if it, in, in my role as National Practitioner Chair, it's to be the voice and the ears uh, of financial advisors. So... I'm a big one about, you know, hearing um, positive and, and sometimes negative stuff. Now, you know, I'm not here to whinge about everything. I would love for more solutions to be the case. So if you do have a great idea, feel free to reach out, you know, even pop it in that community. Uh, we we want to hear about this so that we can take it back. Okay. Awesome, mate. Well, the power is all in the community, which is, um, I think, why the AFA exists, why XY exists as well. So uh, great to see, mate. Keep up the awesome work and, um, yeah, thanks again. Uh, I hope I haven't made it 80, 81 hours this week, but uh, <laughs> appreciate you giving us some of your time. And uh, yeah, I look forward to chatting again on the next one. Yeah, done, mate. Thanks, Ben. All right, thanks, everyone. Cheers.